You're listening to Advancing Our Church. Welcome to Advancing Our Church, a podcast about Catholic stewardship, leadership, and advancement. I'm Jim Friend. I want to wish a Happy New Year to all those who are starting the beginning of a new fiscal year filled with hopes, dreams, and aspirations of accomplishing great things for the mission of our church. As we publish this episode, the numbers for Giving USA came out last month, and if you aren't familiar with Giving USA, they track philanthropy every year for all sectors like education, healthcare, human services, and of course, religion. The report indicates that charitable giving by individuals in 2018 took the largest drop since the 08-09 recession, and giving to religion dropped 1.5% or $3 billion. So some of this can be explained by the changes in the tax code, but a couple of things that we need to have on our radar. First, giving to religion has always been the largest area of giving in philanthropy, much larger than the other sectors. In fact, it's always been over 30%. Unfortunately, it's been lagging behind recently compared to the growth of other sectors. And so religion is actually losing its share of the pie. And this year, we actually fell below 30% of the total giving. This hasn't happened before. What are the factors? Well, according to the Lilly School of Philanthropy, it's the shrinking church attendance and the increasing population of nuns, or people who do not identify with a particular religion. Obviously, those are symptoms of larger issues, but how we address those challenges needs to involve more engagement and new ideas. The Advancing Our Church podcast and Changing Our World are dedicated to providing you the very best in thought leadership and best practices to help you manage through these challenges. And so during the month of July, our podcast will focus on new ideas for your organization to meet these challenging times. Next week, I'll be joined in conversation with two of our consultants, Fred Roberts and Vanessa Dickerson. Our topic will be thinking differently about your development program for 1920. I hope you'll join us. Now, let's get to work. Today, our CEO Brian Crimmins and I travel to his home diocese in the Diocese of Rockville Center, where we meet up with Bishop John Barris, the Bishop of the Diocese, Mark Ackerman, CEO of the Long Island Catholic Foundation, and we're joined on the phone by retired business executive Larry Bossidy. Mr. Bossidy is a Catholic businessman and the retired chairman of the board and CEO of Honeywell International Incorporated. Mr. Bossidy's distinguished five-decade career also includes executive positions at GE, and as CEO of Allied Signal. Now in the business world, Larry's experience speaks for itself, but what we think you'll find even more powerful is the dedication, passion, and drive that each of the men in this conversation has for our church. So without further ado, here's our conversation. All right. Well, gentlemen, welcome to the podcast. We're so happy to have you here. For our listeners, we're here with uh, in the Diocese of Rockville Center with Bishop John Barris, the Bishop of the Diocese. Welcome, Bishop. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we're here with Mark Ackerman, who is the CEO of the Catholic Foundation of Long, Long Island. Mark, welcome. Thank you, Jim. And we're here with our own uh, CEO of Changing Our World, Brian Crimmins. Welcome, Brian. Thanks for being with us. Pleasure, Jim. Thanks. And on the phone, we have world-class CEO and business icon, Larry Bossidy. Larry, are you there? I am, and I'm pleased to be a part of the podcast. Thanks for being here, gentlemen. So our uh, topic today is Faith-Based Execution-Oriented Strategic Planning. Kind of a long title, but of course, it's in honor of Larry's book, The Art of Getting Things Done, Execution-Oriented Strategic Planning. But I thought it might be fun for our listeners first, Bishop, if you were just to share with us how you and Larry first connected. Yes, I I began to read Larry's um, business books, and I, and I just been in involved in so many situations where, you know, very strongly conceived projects just kind of limped and the execution never happened. And so reading Larry's books really inspired me that uh, I think you can summarize Larry Bossidy's management uh, philosophy in the words of Thomas Edison, vision without execution is hallucination. (laughs) I I think that summarizes it. And Larry places an emphasis on, you know, it's, you can have the greatest strategy in the world, but if you don't have the right personnel with the right skills and the right drive and passion and the right commitment to execution and, and the tenacity to see things through, that's so key. So, 
I went up. I've been reading his books, and I went up. I I had a, a somebody who was able to arrange for me to go and see Larry. And I think in about uh, sixty to ninety minutes, I, I just said, "Mr. Bossidy, I've read your uh, book on execution oriented strategic planning. Uh, I'm a young bishop, and I was forty nine years at the time, forty nine years old at the time. And I said, uh, I would like, I would really love to work with you." And uh, I think Larry and I really hit it off from the beginning. He was so gracious, so magnanimous, and so generous. And then, Jim, you got uh, right into that orbit uh, in the Diocese of Allentown when we were working together. And yes. not only were you an outstanding um, advancement person, but I think Larry Bossidy trained you to be an outstanding ecclesial strategic planner. Thank you, Bishop. I appreciate that. Larry, um, I'm just curious, on, on your front, uh, Bishop Barris coming to visit your home, you guys had a great exchange. What were, what were your impressions? That must have been kind of an unusual bishop, or unusual, unusual bishop, but an unusual uh, visit. It was unusual in the sense that here was a young fellow who, who looked at the issues he was, he was facing in Allentown, wanted to get something done. And I tried to uh, find out a couple of things in the, in the course of our discussion, and one was, was he really dedicated to this, passionate about it? And was he going to have the courage to make some of the hard choices as we went along, assuming we were able to identify the right projects and make some advance as we went along? And I concluded that he was. And so on that basis, we decided to work together. It was a pleasure for me to get involved in terms of Allentown and also to see the progress we made along the way. Well, we certainly made some important progress while we were all together, uh, Larry and Bishop, and uh, I think the results kind of speak for themselves. Um, and we all learned a lot just working from you, Larry. I think I remember um, we would uh, we, you would come in quarterly, and we would kind of line up a day of meetings, and the guys uh, would come in and report out on their uh, various uh, committees and topics that they were working on. And I remember a couple of them. I mean, some of them were so excited to meet you, Larry. It was like uh, they were like schoolboys. And these were uh, heads of uh, – these were captains of industry in our little area, uh, business owners. And they would text me afterwards and say, D what did Larry think, Jim? Was Did I do okay? <laughs> <laughs> so it was really uh, – it was exciting for all of us. And I think it really supercharged our work in the Diocese of Allentown. But I was impressed with Larry, too, as he would come in. And we'd have a weekly conference call in addition to um, Larry coming into town, uh, you know, three or four times a year. But uh, he, Larry always had a tremendous respect for the individual uh, as he challenged us. And, and Jim, I don't think anyone was more challenged by Larry Bossidy than Bishop John Barris. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can remember one conference call where we're all there and Ari, Larry asked one of his very penetrating uh, questions and there's no response. And he says, Bishop, the silence is deafening. <laughs> you know? So it's like, but he was, um, he always had that great respect for the individual and a great sense of team chemistry, but also calling the hard questions, analyzing the hard data, getting a path through it, and really challenging. Uh, and I really respected that. He, the other thing, too, is Larry and Nancy Bossidy have just an incredible Catholic marriage with a great uh, family, and uh, that's his base. That's his foundation. So sure. not only is he an American business icon, he's a Catholic American business icon with yeah. a Catholic ethical compass that, uh, in a great sense of Catholic secularity and engagement with the secular world, uh, and a great missionary spirit. I uh, certainly appreciate those comments, Bishop. So, Larry, you wrote a book um, a while back called uh, Execution, The Discipline of Getting Things Done. And when we worked together in Allentown, and I know uh, you've worked with a variety of other nonprofits, you know, in, in your life. Um, how do you see in an ecclesial setting, how does that book get implemented? How, how do those things apply in your mind? You know, I don't think it's as complicated as some think. In other words, to get an execution culture... First of all, as I mentioned a moment ago, you have to have a leader who believes in it, and a, a leader willing to identify the issues, and then selecting people. I'm wary of volunteers, but Jim, friend, we asked you to go identify some talent in the in the diocese to lead the various projects that we thought were necessary to overcome some of the issues that had been identified. 
We need to then have someone like the bishop make the difficult decisions that are made. And you got to do it in a way that's not offensive to people. But you have, nonetheless have to be steadfast to your beliefs. And once things start to get done, in other words, when you can report on some of the progress, it has its own momentum. And then people start talking about the things they have done as opposed to the way they think. I'm always skeptical of philosophers. <laughs> I've always had a lot more faith in those with the ability to get things done. And so that can work in a faith-based setting. There were certain times that I probably got off the reservation in terms of a business viewpoint. The bishop brought it back into balance uh, with the interests uh, of the church. And But uh, in my mind, it's just easily as easily applied in a faith-based setting as it is in a business setting. Well, and I think that's so true, Larry, is we look at, you know, boards of directors uh, and we look at the kind of skill sets that we look to put on our boards. We know that in many of our schools, for example, we have an excellent academic product, but our principals may not have gone to school for business or marketing or other kinds of expertises. So having, you know, folks surrounding yourself as a bishop, as a priest, as a principal, with folks with knowledge from the business uh, business sector can only help, I would imagine. Your thoughts, Bishop? Absolutely. I, I, you know, Thomas Aquinas has a key principle, uh, grace builds on nature. So strategic planning from a Catholic mission perspective, it draws on the skill set, uh, the refined skill set of people like Larry Bossidy, just that Thomas Edison idea of vision without execution is hallucination. From a Catholic perspective, you know, prayer without action is hallucination. And so when you draw on um, Larry Bossidy's sense of execution-oriented strategic, execution strategic planning, finding people who can actually implement and, and move the needle in the right direction, there's a lot of people who can talk a good game. But can you uh, assemble people who can actually uh, move the ball down the field? Uh, that's, I, that's the key. So grace building on nature, those skills can be refined in the church and people can be trained to be more effective, to identify problems, to address them, and to move the mission of the church. But um, where grace kind of ignites those uh, wonderful skills is that strategic planning in the Catholic Church is radically biblical. It needs, you know, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth and Verbum Domini tells us that um, the true realists are the people who open and pray the scriptures every day because that's the lands, the full landscape of reality and supernatural reality and eternal life. Catholic uh, strategic planning, Catholic mission strategic planning is radically Eucharistic. Um, when we're dying to ourselves and rising, when we're following the logic of the pa Paschal Mystery and the sacrifice of the Catholic Mass, when we are silent in front of the Blessed Sacrament and contemplative, that's when we really ignite, uh, the become instruments of igniting the mission of the Church and advancing evangelization and the spirit of the Divine Mercy. Mark, Brian, you guys bring a, a world of knowledge and experience working on different boards and in different faith-based organizations. What are your thoughts on uh, in incorporating the business culture into the ecclesial setting? I, I've uh, had some really interesting experiences in my 40 years working in the not-for-profit space. Uh, I uh, was fortunate to graduate from Catholic University of America and then work immediately after that for the Zaverian brothers, who uh, taught me a lot um, not only about education but uh, fundraising and, and started my uh, development career there and went into uh, then Catholic health care and uh, continued my work. And had had two, uh, as I'm sitting here listening to His Excellency, I, I, I think of two things that have happened in my life where I think I, I followed a lot of Larry's thinking and having read his book over the last week or so, um, even though I didn't, don't know Larry other than meeting him today, I feel like I've, I've been a disciple of his in many ways. Um, I, I was at uh, the Chief Administrative Officer of St. Vincent's Hospital on 11th Avenue and 7th, uh, 7th Avenue and 11th Street. Um, on 9-11. And I was, as the chief administrative officer uh, of the organization, the chief executive was not in the building um, when the towers came down. We had the most uh, patients because we were the closest level one trauma center. I knew our 
trauma center team was well prepared because we had taken care of patients from the first World Trade Center bombing, a number of other activities. And so that was going to run smoothly. What we weren't prepared for as much was the influx of worldwide media that descended upon us immediately. And I, having a communications background, took over the media relations right from the second hour on and, and literally had to, um, for next six weeks, uh, handle um, all of the media aspects of, of that event. Uh, not only the 856 patients who came to us and their families, the 6,000 families who registered looking for their loved ones, and the weeks and weeks of media um, work that was done after that. Uh, and then taking that experience, you know, and as Larry talks about the, the people process and the strategy process and, and the operations process, utilizing that to help um, other healthcare organizations around the country and around the world to become prepared for the next events, which sadly over these last 18 years have happened time and time again. So being prepared uh, for uh, traumatic events um, and operationalizing what you've uh, learned and taught um, really works well. And the other experience I remember um, that I, I think I really got to utilize these processes was uh, Pope Benedict's visit to the United States. I was very, Excellent, yeah. very blessed to be asked uh, by Cardinal Egan to run uh, the the visit in the Archdiocese of New York and at the United Nations. And we had eight months to uh, plan and prepare and execute. And so, Larry, I, I hadn't read your book yet, but I think um, you'll appreciate this story. We We literally picked the best people possible. We were fortunate to have whatever resources we need, the Secret Service, the FBI, the New York City Police, all who thought they were better than each other uh, <laughs> doing what they did. Um, and, and you know, the advanced team from the Vatican coming in, the first meeting I'll never forget in his eminence's conference room saying, well, we need, a, you know, three Chinook helicopters and we need the, the president's helicopter and the president's limousine and, and the people from the White House looking with great astonishment and saying, well, excuse us, we have to make a phone call, coming back a moment later and saying, President Bush has said, whatever you need, you will have. Nice. Um, but, but the team that we assembled in the Archdiocese and from the Archdiocese of Washington uh, came together, put together uh, an incredible plan. You have to remember this was just seven years after 9-11. We were able to seat 108,000 people at eight different venues over three days, get everyone to submit their name, address, and social security number if they wanted a ticket so they could be vetted, um, and arrange for the buses for all those people to go in and out and, and New York City to come to a standstill when it needed to for the Holy Father. It all came together. We had great people and the strategy worked, and from an operational perspective, it all came together. So with the grace of God, we were fortunate enough to, and I was blessed to have the opportunity to run that operation, and for all of Larry's strategy and planning processes to come together and work. Great stories, uh, Mark. Fantastic uh, witness, certainly, to not only the principles that Larry puts in place, but uh, to great communication and organization on your part. I, I'm sure that it, that experience is serving you well now as the new CEO of the Long Island Catholic Foundation. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I, I once again am um, overly blessed with a new opportunity that His Excellency and the Board of uh, the new Catholic Community Foundation of Long Island have uh, given to me. Um, I worked for almost uh, over 20 years um, in the faith-based world and then 10 years uh, for an organization called Lighthouse International for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and then was given an opportunity, kind of, um, in my mind, a capstone of my career, perhaps for the next 10 years, to operationalize a new foundation here on, on Long Island. As uh, His Excellency is wont to say, uh, the Diocese of Rockville Center does a lot of amazing things. Fundraising has not been one of them. Mm. We've underperformed pretty dramatically. We are very blessed to have a very diverse community here, two counties that um, are incredible, and some of the wealthiest people in the world living in these counties. But we're also in a unique situation in that one of the most famous archdioceses in the world is just a few counties away, and most of these people who live here work in the archdiocese of New York, and by virtue of that, they're on the boards of Catholic Charity in the archdiocese or the Inner City Scholarship Fund, and God bless them all, the cardinals of New York have been incredible at getting significant philanthropy out of people who live in this diocese of Rockville Center. His Excellency, when he came to the diocese two years ago, decided to operationalize this um, uh, 
Foundation, which had been actually put together by his predecessor, but not operationalized. And uh, the board put together a search. Um, I was very blessed to to have been uh, asked to come on board and, and get things started. And we worked with the bishop and his team, uh, Tom Ranker in particular, uh, his chief operating officer and, and uh, chief counsel, to really um, make this a unique foundation. Only one other that Brian and I are aware of in the United States that is um, an independent foundation. We are designed uh, uh, by and run by the faithful of Nassau and Suffolk County, New York. And thus we call ourselves the Catholic Community Foundation because we truly are run by the Catholic community. We have a membership corporation that is uh, very um, important to us, uh, and but it is uh, the majority of those individuals are lay people, and the chair of that board is a lay person. And then our fiduciary board will be 21 people, 20 of whom will be lay people, and the officers of the corporation and the chairperson will be lay people. Because this is an entity brought together by the Catholic faithful to raise money to be utilized for the Catholic ministries here in Nassau and Suffolk County, New York. We will have the opportunity to raise significant philanthropy for Catholic charities, for Catholic education, for Catholic health care, for new evangelization, all of the ministries of the diocese, and bringing that powerful case together with an incredible laity and a wonderful board that we are just starting to grow now. Bishop was talking a little while ago about bringing together people from all areas. We are trying to be culturally diverse. We're trying to be uh, gender diverse on our board. We're trying to uh, have people who want to support the work of the Diocese of Rockville Center. These are challenging times to raise money in the Catholic Church. There's no question. But there are dedicated and committed Catholic faithful who want to continue and rebuild the work of the church. And so we, um, just in the first few months, I will, will admit, I got some wide eyes when I went to my first board meeting in December, Bishop, and you may remember this. I said, I, I just want you to know, it's my opinion that to be on this board, anyone who sits on this board should plan on giving or getting a minimum of $100,000 a year for us. If you can't come to that level of working with us to help raise that kind of money, Thank you, but but we really need to find people who can do that. And and to a person, they have all done that. Two of them have already committed a uh, million dollars each and um, in our first few months, and we're working with another major benefactor on a very significant commitment right now. So we're, we're fortunate. We've hit the ground running. We're starting to build a board that's going to be really powerful and, and helpful to us. We are going to um, bring some of that philanthropy and keep it here at home in the Diocese of Rockville Center. Uh, and and we're also, through Brian Crimmins' uh, efforts working with us, uh, going to be a harbor for donor-advised funds. And so uh, the Catholic Community Foundation uh, donor-advised funds will bring Catholic wealth together. We'll be able to invest it for them, make sure it, we are good uh, shepherds for their resources, and, and we will continue to work to grow an incredible endowment that will help the Diocese of Rockville Center continue and grow as this Catholic community uh, grows. Well, that's wonderful, Mark. A, a very um, articulate explanation and, and a lot of exciting things happening uh, here in the diocese. Brian, as a lifelong resident, it must be exciting to be a part of this effort. It, it really is. And, you know, Jim, listening to, to Bishop and Larry and Mark talk, it all comes down to one word, which is leadership. Right. And, you know, Bishop's arrival two years ago, I remember a good friend of mine, uh, Matt Stolsel, when Bishop was named, sent me a YouTube video of Bishop shooting hoops with some young kids. And, and I thought immediately, he, he struck me as someone who, just in that video, seemed to be very team-oriented, action-oriented, what have you. And I thought, wow, this is going to be a real moment in time for the Diocese of Rockville Center. And um, having a chance to meet Bishop as soon as he arrived and talking about philanthropy and, and how can we really galvanize. And we were talking before we started this podcast, Larry mentioned a resurgence in the church. And, yeah. and, and in many ways, we are, we are there on Long Island with Bishop's leadership and with Mark's leadership. I think this is a going to be a real capstone moment for the next five to ten years in the diocese. And, but it all comes down to what we've been talking about in my humble opinion, it comes down to leadership. Um, when you get people like Larry Bossidy and, and Bishop and Mark in the positions they're in, uh, and as they said, and you build a team around them, great things can happen. And, and it is. It's very, very rewarding to have grown up here and to be able to even assist in a small way. Because in 
our diocese in their hands. We're going to do some amazing things over the next five to ten years. And what's exciting with Brian Crimmins uh, from Changing Our World is that Brian knows Long Island. It's in his blood. It's in his bones. But he's had so many case studies around the country and globally. Comment, how does that help your perspective, Brian, in terms of your native Long Island? You know, everyone, you know, you, you went to yeah. Chaminade. You know everyone here. You're a St. John's grad. We've, I've grown to love St. John's University and that mission. And yet you're doing all sorts of strategic planning, advancement work around the country, and then you bring it back to Long Island. How does it all work? Yeah, great question. For me, and, and Mark will probably know, about a week and a half ago, uh, Mark and I were meeting with uh, the chair and the vice chair of the foundation. And for me, Bishop, to answer your question, it's summarized in that meeting because th- these are – Two wonderful individuals who've done, who do amazing things, are on great boards. But when we're talking about the foundation, the Catholic Community Foundation of Long Island, and we're talking, it's a new entity and people are trying to understand its role. What does it do? How does it, to your point, Bishop, our, my ability to explain to them what we just did in St. Louis, what we're doing in LA, Dallas, all of, I think provides a lot of comfort to them, to them realize that for us here in the Diocese of Rockville Center, it, of the 180-ish dioceses, about 85% of them have foundations. So it's not new. It's, it's actually how many of dioceses are organizing themselves and, and organizing their fundraising. But to be able to bring some of the context, some of the case studies from all other parts of the country, whether it be big cities, small cities, diverse cities, you know, in diocesan, diocesan work, to bring it to Long Island, to bring it to leaders who I've known and worked with in other capacities, but to, to show them what is possible – and give them real tangible examples. I mean, I love talking about the work we did in the Archdiocese of St. Louis because $110 million for, for Catholic education, um, you know, through a newly established foundation. It's, it's almost like Groundhog's Day in, in many ways because when we started that, Mark Guile came out of uh, uh, CEO of the foundation, brand new organization. And I said to the chair and the vice chair of our Catholic Community Foundation, I said, we had these same conversations four years ago in St. Louis. Can we do it? What, what will happen, et cetera? And to see the results of all that four years later, to see the great work that's going on and on for Catholic education. And, you know, I follow them on social media and to see the big checks they're handing out for great work that's being done in schools. I know that's in our future. And I, I, I feel in many ways that's my job now is to bring some of the great experiences that I've been fortunate to have around the country internationally, done some projects with the Vatican, et cetera, to bring it now t- time home, to bring it home and to really, you know, make this moment with the leadership of Bishop and Mark to do whatever I can do to bring that to the table. And um, you know, uh, oh, yeah, one, one thing I think as this conversation unfolds is when you when you see when I see the church making its resurgence, it also tells me that we can make it more appealing to the people who attend. In other words, there's competition out there now for people. The evangelicals, for example, have done remarkably well in expanding their populace over the years. So as we can show people the progress that can be made by undertaking and completing projects for the betterment of the diocese, I think it's also uh, uh, evident to people outside that it's it's alive, it's competitive, it's progressive. And uh, as a consequence, it's going to be more satisfying and will attract more people over time. Well said, said, Larry. And, you know, Bishop, uh, if there's a if there's another bishop or maybe even a pastor who's listening right now and thinking, I really would like to undertake strategic planning in my own diocese. I know there's a lot of issues, but I'm not exactly sure where to start. Where did you start? And where what would you recommend? Well, uh, the first, the game changer in the Catholic Church historically is radical holiness. Mm-hmm. That's um, that above all things is the game changer strategically is, you know, just historically in church history, when you, just when you see you, people believe that the Catholic church is breaking down and about to go out of existence, the Holy Spirit raises up incredible saints of the moment of that moment in history who address the real life needs of the church. Uh, for instance, in, with, you know, the clergy sexual abuse crisis, I am really, I really believe there's going to be some great saints who were survivors of clergy sexual abuse, who are raised up by the Holy Spirit, uh, and in their traumas and wounds and their crosses, uh, lead us to a new era. Um, that's how the Holy Spirit works. And one of the things I've always, my my um, Episcopal motto is holiness and mission. It comes from St. John Paul II's uh, 
uh, Redemptoris Missio, which is his blockbuster encyclical on global uh, mission. And at the end of it, he says, you cannot separate the call to holiness from the call to mission that the great saints in history were both holy and missionary. It calls the question, do we believe as Catholics in the 21st century that the church can be boldly and radical, radically missionary with all the challenges of the culture, with all the challenges and crosses that the church and the wounds of the church of this day um, we're called as Catholics to believe what we actually believe and profess in the Apostles' Creed every Sunday. And Pope Francis calls all of us out. He wants us to be confident evangelizers. And I have been inspired by uh, his uh, sense of mission, his boldness, along with his ecumenical sensitivity and interreligious sensitivity and sense of uh, in you know, serving the entire world. Uh, so it's a real call for us. One of the things I mention, uh, one of the thing, the phrase I use in just about every writing or homily or talk I give is dramatic missionary growth. The church on Long Island and around this country and around the world is called to dramatic missionary growth. And when you hear that, it's like, could that really happen? And then I mentioned uh, historically that um, if you go to a scavi tour in Rome, scavi is the Italian word for excavations. If you go into St. Peter's and you sign up, you can go through an old Roman cemetery and discover the bones of St. Peter, which are there. And that in the late 30s, um, the bones had had not had been lost. And uh, Pope Pius XII commissioned archaeologists to go through this old cemetery to go on this quest for the bones of St. Peter, and indeed they found the bones of St. Peter. Now, the question is, when you step back from that, how did the church, how did the Roman Catholic Church, the universal sacrament of salvation, the church that Christ himself established, how did we ever lose <laughs> the bones of St. Peter? Right. <laughs> you know, how do we ever lose them? And then we find them in the 20th century, and now it's a, it's a beautiful devotion. But there's a parallel point. We sometimes lose, just as the bones of St. Peter were lost, sometimes we lose who we are and our call to mission, and our call to be confident missionaries, our call to spread the light of Christ to the ends of the earth, to baptize all nations. I'm the son of um, two convert Protestant ministers who really made big sacrifices to follow uh, the light of the Holy Spirit into the Catholic Church. And my father ended up being a writer for Bishop Sheen, one of the great global missionaries, the American St. Paul in the propagation of the faith. And we also became, my parents became great friends of some of the great Marinol global missionaries. A Father John Considine which was the key Marinol miss, missiologist in the 20, 20th century. So the home I grew up in had Marinol missionaries, Bishop uh, William McNaughton, the Bishop Emeritus still living of Incheon, Korea. Uh, and these great Marinolers, kind of the Bishop influ Sheen influence was my home was really, my parents were in so immersed and committed to global worldwide mission. And I, as I, I'm a 58 year old bishop, and, you know, I was baptized by Bishop Sheen because um, my father was working for him. That means more and more to me as a bishop because uh, the baptismal call to holiness and mission and being baptized by Bishop Sheen, I feel I have a special responsibility to promote global worldwide mission from Long Island. Beautiful. Larry, let's talk a little bit about turnarounds. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you've been a turnaround artist, and uh, turnaround, it involves courage, it involves faith. From my perspective as a Catholic bishop, I've got to be praying really deeply. I've got to be immersed in the Eucharist. I've got to be immersed in the Word of God. I've got to be a missionary to be able to, you know, the, the cliche these days is change management. How do you, how do you, embark on change, whether it's ecclesial change or change in a corporation, <coughs> that often involves, you know, some heavily heavily pitched resistance. How do you um, work it in a way with emotional intelligence that mo that's motivational, but that recognizes the human resistance to change? You know, it'd be great to hear your, your uh, thoughts on that, because there's not one of us who hasn't gone into a situation and say, you know, in all humility, I've got to be an instrument of some sort of 
progressive incremental change that makes a difference? You know, I think I think you start by making sure wherever you are in terms of the environment as to what's been disappointing and hence for the need for turnaround. What can we do about it? And where does it lead if we're successful? In other words, I like to see it based on hope and optimism and faith. That if we do these things, we can bring this organization or diocese or whatever to a point that we're all going to feel far more comfortable with than we do now. And along the way, we're going to have to make some tough choices. Uh, some people, in the case there might be job loss, we've got to be able to handle that with dignity and generosity, but nonetheless handle it. And then get people to know on the progress you're making so you can build a momentum of success. One of the things I thought you did well in Allentown, that as we progressed with the various projects that were underway, I remember a night where we brought all the people together that were working on these and leading these projects together before an audience of, uh, of other Catholics somewhere in the diocese, and they each talked about what they'd accomplished. And, as, and I think that raises the momentum, if you will, and, and the attitude and the pride of others in the audience. So I think if you can base it on optimism and show some improvement, then it gains momentum and you're on your way to accomplish what can be some ter- terrific objectives. This is Mark Ackerman. I, I just want to add on to that, Larry. Thank you for saying that. I, I think the momentum of success, as you just talked about, is so very important. It's There are situations, and I've been in two or not-for-profit organizations that had to go through very significant turnarounds. One was successful and one was not, and I, I've seen both sides of it. And I think one has to be careful to resist the slash and burn mentality of just slashing and burning for the sake of slashing and burning. It's easy to cut, 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 and try to cut your way to success, but ultimately it never works. Making sure you have momentum towards success, making sure you understand that, yes, there is going to be pain, and yes, there is going to be job loss, and yes, we're going to do it with dignity and generosity, as you so beautifully put, that will happen, but it's not slashing and burning for the sake of slashing and burning, which too many people equate turnaround with that, and that's just something we will all work to avoid as we go through these challenging times that, that um, you know, you can bring consultants in who are great at just slashing and burning and cutting here and cutting there. And that's not going to lead to success or that momentum of success. So I, I wanted to thank you for saying that because it's, I've seen it on both sides, unfortunately. And, and when one works towards success rationally and carefully and prudently, um, with the grace of God, you get there, and, and that's, um, I think, where the success is. Slashing and burning doesn't raise morale. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> this whole conversation about, you know, even dealing with the individual, the people through change and what have you, I, it's so important. You know, the, the, I, for me, working with nonprofits and corporations, the, the ethical leadership is starting to come back as a real main, which to me is what the church has always been about. Um, and so when, when, when Bishop, which I loved, was talking about Larry and called him a Catholic leader or Catholics, that's, to me, that's what that's about, you know? And I can't help but think, and forgive me for on going on a personal note here, but um, when my dad was in his last final hours, one of our dear friends, a priest, came by the house and he went in the room with my dad and uh, came out. And I said, do you mind... If I asked what you guys talked about, and he said, I, I asked him if he had any regrets. My dad re- had a pretty big job at Midlife Insurance, and he said, I, I do. And he said, I, I regret having to let go of people. And he said, not because they weren't right for the job. He said, because they have families. And, and he said, and, and you know that sums up, and what we're talking about here is not only the courage to lead through change, but to understand that you're, talk, you're dealing with individuals and humans and, and their livelihoods and their families and doing it in, in a respectful way, doing it in a Catholic way. And I think... There's a re- we talked about this already. There's a resurgence with the church, but in many ways, I think there's a resurgence of what the church has always been about in society. Uh, and I think you know this is this whole conversation. We're ta- in many ways we're talking in the context of a di- di- diocese or a foundation for a Catholic church, but we're really talking about something bigger, mm-hmm. in in my opinion. And we're talking about what I see, which is the the whole world hopefully coming back to what it means to be Catholic and to be an ethical leader like Larry and like Bishop and like Mark and, you know, the church, the, the society as a whole needs more people who actually understand what we're talking about today. 
You know, but it's interesting too. I've always, one of the things Jim Friend and I always, um, in our conversations with Larry, we always said, how do you identify talent? How do you identify um, people who can really lead? How do you uh, be an instrument of developing them and serving them and in so doing, serving the church or whatever organization you're involved in? I um, I was a JV basketball player at Princeton University during the Coach Pete Carrill era. And Coach Carrill uh, was a you know, NBA and a college basketball coach legend. He used to talk about light bulb players, players. They may not have been the greatest in terms of talent, but they were the first ones on the floor for the loose ball. They just raised the tone of the entire team by the, the careful way they made their cuts, the precise way they made picks, um, the way and, and their whole attitude. And Larry, talk to us a little bit, you know, what, as in one of our conversations, you, you can't ever predict completely in a job interview where thing, things are going to go. But talk to us a little bit about um, the skill of identifying talent and in all charity, being someone who leaves a legacy of people that we've inspired and humbly served uh, to take their place in the church and society. You know, I think the... Uh the interview process, to start with my response, is, in my mind, uh, uh, just full of disappointment. In other words, uh, you you can't convey in terms of one-on-one some of the things that need to be said. For example, I like to have people tell me what they have done. I like to take the opportunity to check with the people they've worked with. I like to hear what they want to do and why do they want to come to my company? What can they contribute? And then I'd like to have that person talk to three or four people on my staff and then get together and decide uh, in terms of the comments forthcoming as to whether we should make a job offer. And then when we do, to observe them carefully for at least a while to see if they've been able to acclimate themselves to the culture are they able to be able to perform in a way that makes them feel good and us feel good? And then what kind of further objectives can we place on them to let them realize their own destiny? Now, you do this as carefully as you can. And, you know, I was in business for 40 years, and I made many mistakes on that side of the coin, but I never gave up the effort. And I think at the end of the day, whatever success I had, depended on the quality of the people I was able to attract and to motivate and ultimately reward. Larry, I, I just want to share a, one thing that happened to me once in an interview, and I've now utilized this tactic in every interview I've ever done. This person who asked me this question turned out to be one of my best bosses ever for a very long time. And during the interview, which went along very much as you just talked about, he also asked me to talk about my biggest disappointment. And he didn't say your biggest failure or your biggest downfall. And he didn't say your biggest disappointment at work or or at home. He just said, what was your biggest disappointment? And I went on to talk about a personal thing that that I was disappointed in myself in. And ultimately, some years later, he told me that's what made him hire me, was that I was able to be very candid in an unexpected question like that. And so it it was an interesting tact that I had never gone through before, but um, it really helped bring that side of me out in the conversation. You know, I think there's another thing, too, that we need to do in any organizational setting, is to ask ourselves over time, is our organization getting better? In other words, are we more capable of getting done what we set out as objectives? And are we growing? I always thought, uh, as a CEO, that we could always be better than we were. Not to say we weren't appreciative and thankful for those who have completed some nice efforts, but rather what can we do more uh, to escalate and to provide people with more opportunity to excel? And, and you, therefore, you do make changes along the way. Uh, you know, you have people who reach the top of their capability. It's sad. You don't have to replace them, but you've got to put them in places where they can continue to contribute and then let others uh, lead perhaps where they had been in a way that can be more productive and successful. Excellent, Larry. Uh, Larry, you know, we, I've, I've got some great Catholic lay people around me here. And um, 
Maybe you could give us some advice. What does faith-based career, Catholic faith-based career management mean? How does uh, the Holy, you know, how does a a lay woman, a lay man who has a family, who's, you know, has the pressures of, of marriage and family and is trying to navigate a career, uh, you know, trying to be faithful to the Catholic Mass and the Eucharist or Catholic moral teaching, trying to have a very healthy Catholic secularity and engagement with the world while being radically faithful to the teachings of the church and the gospel. What's your, what's your advice to, to, People of all ages trying to, whether it's Mark Ackerman, who's kind of uh, was mentioning that he's kind of on his last uh, key run in his career, to Mark and uh, to Brian and Jim, who are a little more in the middle age area. Um, what's your what's your sense as as what's distinct about Catholic discernment of career management? You know, I think remember I got nine kids and thirty grandchildren. <laughs> I talk a lot about that in terms of the various things they're doing in their lives. But I always felt that as I was going through and trying to keep up and educate nine children and maintain a successful marriage and a career, that I needed the faith more than it needed me. In other words, I could rely on faith. That when I was under stress or some of the conditions, I always felt comfortable and relying on my faith to help me get through. I don't think you can say I'm going to catch up with it later in my life. Uh, I don't think you say that it doesn't matter, because I think it's front and center. I don't think you have to press with ties all over the organization about what you are or what you think about from a faith standpoint, but I do think it has to be, has to be an integral part of who you are. And the more you can continue that faith, the more you have a chance to lead the kind of life that is going to make uh, you successful and happy. And I think it's in the, uh, that's well said, Larry, I think it's in the, the daily and the weekly example that we set out for our kids. I remember when my kids were little, and, and still today, we always sat in the front. Why? Because if I sat in the middle or the back, they couldn't see. All they were doing is looking at backs. But sitting in the front of Mass taught them early on that the reverence of the Mass, how to behave in Mass, and they and and they responded. Now that's not to say we didn't have the occasional meltdown in the front of the church <laughs> <laughs> with a three-year-old, but um, but I think they see that example. You know, trying to live the Catholic faith through my amazing wife Kristen, and with, I think it's also about marrying the right person who's going to support you in that vocation and support you. Uh, you know, when you're out many hours, as Brian and I travel around the country, uh, working with different nonprofits and different parishes and such. Um, it's it's someone who's who's there going to be with you and, and walk with you throughout the entire journey. That's that's the secret, I think, to success. And you know, the other thing that I remind myself is, and, and what I took from our association with Bishop Barris in Allentown is this: I I basically went to church with my family, tried to profess my faith, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the same time, I saw the church beginning to regress in terms of making the changes necessary to keep it vital. And I kind of put that aside, saying that's somebody else's issue. I just want to make sure that I continue my own my own faith, etc. But when I got to Allentown and I could get into some detail and see what could be done and was done, then it's given me encouragement and the interest in helping others in, in, in various dioceses to do the same, and also to encourage my friends to get involved and do the same. In other words, there are things that any organization needs vitality and renewal and progression. And, uh, you know, there's nobody better than people with various experiences, including that in business, to join in and see if you can make that happen. So it was encouraging to see what we could get done through the bishop's leadership in Allentown, and what we can get done in other dioceses as well, I think. Well, and I saw that, Larry, uh, in the way the bishop not only engaged you, but when in the way he engaged other people when we were in Allentown, and thinking specifically about uh, the Bishop's Commission on Catholic Schools, that for two short years, we were able to turn around enrollment and actually increase over a period of time because we got the right folks behind marketing and business and boards and uh, laser focus across the entire school system uh, on the right key performance indicators that uh, that allowed us to grow and flourish. So um, 
always kudos to you, Bishop, for in, engaging the right people and putting in and putting the right people in the right seats on the bus. People with gracious faith and tenacity, just uh, you know, just incredible lay people who light the mission of the church. Mm-hmm. Well, gentlemen, this has been a fantastic conversation. Why don't we just kind of go around, Robin, real quick, and uh, for any kind of final thoughts, uh, start with you, Brian. Sure. Jim, you heard me say this um, two days ago, but uh, my dad, 40 years, had on his desk, and I think it summarizes what Larry was just saying, an expression that we all fought over after he retired. My brother Dan has it, but that'll be fine. The sign said, are you here as part of the solution, or are you here as part of the problem? And he said, when when people would walk in to usually complain or to, you know, to, that mindset, are you here as part of the solution or here as part of the problem? And, uh, you know, as I said, he passed away four years ago, but he instilled in myself and, and Larry, my eight other siblings, I'm, I'm the youngest of nine, to always try to be part of the solution. And, um, you know, that's sort of been in our DNA and certainly drives me every day. And this, this conversation is no better example of people who are part of the solution. So it's been a pleasure to be part of it. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm the piker in the room. I only have six children, so I, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I have found, and particularly in listening to you, Larry, uh, and thank you for taking the time to, to be with us today because I've learned so much from you, but we often find people in places we never expect to find them, and there is so much goodness out there. Bishop and I had the opportunity to have dinner a week or two ago with a an amazing Cuban-American couple. Um, the gentleman happens to be on the board of the foundation, and I knew he was a real powerhouse. Neither the bishop nor I knew his wife. And Bishop, I mean, <laughs> she was amazing, and she's going to be a great leader in this diocese, I think. So we, we just keep finding new people who have this reverence and who have this ability. This is a woman who was a, a corporate leader for much of her career, in, in training and education in the corporate world and is now in her own little tiny corner of, of Long Island teaching Latin American and Cuban American individuals leadership skills that they're using in the church, they're using in their parishes. And that was the gift that she's doing in her own quiet way and nobody even knew who she was or where she was doing. So there's great gifts out there. It was a, that was quite an evening, Mark. Larry, one of the things I think, you know, from our beginning – uh, was one of the things that we help us to, helped us to understand each other was the athletic backgrounds we both had. One of the things I'm very proud in terms of Larry's background is he pitched in the College World Ser- Series for Colgate University in 1955. And uh, as I said, I you know just uh, the Princeton basketball experience with Coach Carrill and the great JV coaches I had. Um, I think. Larry understood that I could take correction. Athletes take a lot of correction, a lot of adjustments in the halftime rooms, and sometimes the volume of those corrections can be pretty high. <laughs> so, uh, I don't, Larry, I think that common background uh, kind of helped us to understand each other, and we, we didn't hold back. We went right at things and addressed things. But um, also, I think, you know, just those experiences as young people, I, you know, and any young people who might be listening to this podcast, that um, all those different experiences, whether it's in, in an orchestra or somebody with a developed acting talent, all these things are the Holy Spirit preparing you for what's ahead. I really think that uh, pitching the Colgate World, you know, the, for Colgate in the 1955 World Series, the Holy Spirit had some sort of plan for your uh, your incredible corporate con- contribution. What's the what's the relationship between being a pitcher for Colgate uh, in that World Series and what happened in your business career? You know, I think when you engage in sports to begin with. You get to appreciate the value of teamwork, that a team is better than one. I think you begin to understand how to lose, which is painful, but it's also a part of life. And I think it teaches you to be competitive. In other words, to try to overcome obstacles, to not get depressed on things that don't go your way every day. And, uh, you know, Colgate doesn't even have a baseball team now. But I still hear from the guys that I played with way back in 1955 to the extent that they're living. So I think it gives you a a great platform for life in terms of the obstacles and the disappointments that you'll be able to overcome and uh, move forward. I also think that when you look at the church today, 
and you see what's going on in several of the dioceses, including, I'm sure, the one in Rockville. You, 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 under, you communicate to people that, that it can be vital, that it can be progressive, that it can be a source of strength for people who uh, elect to join the, the, the faith in the diocese. And it, it's a very positive thing now. I know it's difficult to defend the tragedies that have been exposed in the last couple of years, but you can't dwell on that. You can't deny it. You can't bury it, but you can't dwell on it. you got to get to a better place. And uh, I, I'm convinced that with all of the turbulence in our world and all of the disappointment in our world, being able to give faith people a solid foundation of faith that's going to be able to get them through a period which they need desperately in order to reach their own destinies. Well, and given the climate that uh, that we're in today, uh, that's a that's a wonderful uh, way to end our podcast today, Larry. Thank you so much, and thank you, Bishop and Mark and Brian, uh, for being on the podcast today. This was an excellent conversation, and it was great to be with you again, personally, Bishop. Thank Jim, you, Jim. Thanks for bringing us together. It's great to see you, and uh, Brian and Mark. I'm enjoying working with you so much, and Larry. All I can do is thank you, thank you, thank you. You've been one of the absolutely critical mentors in my life. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. And, uh, Thanks. Jim, uh, thank you for arranging this, and all the best to everyone. Thank you, Larry. Thanks, Larry. I want to thank Larry Bossidy, Bishop Barris, Mark Ackerman, and Brian Crimmins for being on our show this week. It was amazing to be a part of that conversation, and I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Next week, we talk about getting ready for the 1920 fiscal year, a new year filled with new strategies. I hope you'll join us. Well, that's our show this week. Special thanks to Changing Our World podcast team of Mackenzie O'Connor, Colleen Burdick, Sebastian Lurie, Jean Ann Montagna, and Pottery Studios. If you'd like more information about our show, please visit our website at advancingourchurch.com. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Advancing Our Church is a production of Changing Our World, a fundraising and social impact consulting firm that has been advising nonprofits and corporations for the past 20 years. For more information, please visit us at changingourworld.com. Well, that's it for me, everybody. Have a great week. Take care. and God bless. <music>